So, good evening and welcome everybody to this public lecture during this conference. I think uh, the idea of this public lecture is uh, an excellent one to give uh, a chance uh, to present some of uh, uh, ideas and uh, methods of statistics to a wider public to show them the relevance of what we're doing. So can I ask, uh, are there non-mathematicians or non-statisticians in the audience? Could they raise their hand? <laughs> yeah, one. <laughs> Okay, but I think uh, it will also be interesting for the statisticians and mathematicians here <laughs> to learn what uh, the speaker tonight has to tell us because he is someone who is very well qualified for this. He got his PhD in Madison then was in North Carolina sometime. I don't know if I skipped some of his stations. Now he is at NCAR, the National Center of Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. That's one of the worldwide leading centers doing research related to atmospheric sciences. He's the director of the Institute for Mathematics Applied to Geosciences. That's uh, Image. The, uh, the French words uh, invading the US. And uh, we are really looking forward. We are going to tell us about climate past, present, and future, a tale from a statistician. How's that? Oh, okay. <clears throat> a, uh, a public lecture is, is a new thing for me, and it's pretty scary. <clears throat> um, the way I'm going to approach the, uh, the, 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 the public lecture is uh, I, I left out all the formulas, and um, which is, which is good. The, 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 the bad news is that I've also left out all of the um, statistics as to how I've gotten to things. So um, I'm going to be showing you a, a lot of pictures. I hope that it's going to be entertaining. I want to thank you all for coming at the end of a long day. Um, this is really, uh, really supportive. OK, so um, how is this talk going to work? <clears throat> I'm going to give a little bit of introduction about climate and weather. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uncertainty, and then, then I want to talk about three different uh, s statistical projects. And this is basically um, the idea that when, when in doubt, you should talk about things that you know and not try to talk about things that you don't know. And I'm, I'm really going to just give you an, um, a little bit of an idea of what a statistician does in these, in these three, three different projects. And as I said, it's not going to be scary. We'll just have a lot of pictures to, to, to look at. Okay, <clears throat> so let me, great. Okay, so this has already been, been covered a few times. Um, it doesn't hurt to cover it again. Um, so th this is the difference between climate and weather. Um, climate is what you expect, weather is what you get. So here, here's an example of weather. This is a, a thunderstorm that's sort of falling um, sort of right, right, right by the mountains. Um, this, this poor gentleman here is also the subject of weather. There was apparently an, an extreme rain, rain event, and so he's standing in front of his house here, and it's, and it's flooding. Um, so, so what would be climate? Well, climate might be, for example, the 30-year average rainfall for this area. And in fact, from this picture, you can see what kind of uh, climate this has. So do you, do you think this, this place gets a lot of rain or a little rain? Yeah, yeah, not, not too much. This is sort of say, oops, sorry. 
this is sagebrush here, so, so, so there's not, not, not too much. Um, and uh, so the, and the, the important thing about, about this event here is that um, this is an event due to climate. Um, and, 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 and that's about all, all we can say. It's an, in, it's an extreme event, and we'll be talking a, a little bit about that later, later in the talk, because something that's quite controversial is whether these extreme events are due to climate change or not. And um, so, so we'll be coming, coming back to that. Okay. So that's climate and weather. Why, why are we here? Um, I, I hope that you're here because you, you've heard a little bit about this, something about global warming, and, and maybe you're interested in, in, in learning about that. Um, what, what we have here are some o overview plots of, of sort of basically describing the, the, the global warming situation. And, and let, let me really just talk about the top one here. <clears throat> What we have is um, starting when they first really started measuring temperature with thermometers around eight, 1850. Um, this is the, the, the global temperature. Um, it's been, um, we, we've subtracted off, off a number so that there's, there's sort of a zero reference point here. But what we see over time is that the global temperature is varying, but it's sort of steadily in increasing. And that's the, that's the warming we're, we're talking about. That's the climate change. Um, now, if, if you go back, just to review a little bit, if you, if you go back to my original slide saying weather is what we see outside, climate is a, is a long-term average, you might say, well, if climate is a long-term average, then it has to be fixed. So how can it change? So in fact, climate change is sort of an oxymoron um, because it, it, it can't change, but it's, it's, it's a fixed value. So, um, but, but really, really what's happening here is, is we're looking at sort of windows of about 30 years or 20 years, and we're saying within that window, we're saying things are pretty much the same. So that's, that's sort of a reference point that we're going to go, go from. Okay. Um, what's the other reason we're here? The, the other reason we're here is, is sort of the, the other, and other, another leg of global warming is, is that things are changing besides temperature. And, and what I've plotted here is, is just the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. This is a very long sort of derived series from 10,000 years ago all the way up to the present. You see that it's, it's at fairly low values here. Um, this little bit right here has been um, expanded. Um, this is the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, and um, most of this CO2 in increase is, is due to human activities, basically um, burning coal and um, using um, other kinds of, of fossil fuels in industry. Um, so that, that's the other ingredient of this. Okay, so. Um, the, the, the third leg of this is, um, is relating these two together. And so what I wanted to do just to round out this little background of, of climate is I wanted to talk about some very um, basic scientific results that, that, that support this. And um, these are things that we're just going to talk about and we're going to say these are, these are things that have been established. And then I'm going to go on and talk about other aspects of climate that are, that are more uncertain. Okay, so in, in the last century, we have um, global warming over the last century. Um, we have increased greenhouse gases. Um, that's really carbon dioxide. And remember, that's from basically human activities such as um, driving our cars, um, power plants burning coal, and, and uh, some, some other things. And then finally, the, 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 the third part of this tripod is, is a cause and effect for relationship. And this is where more of sort of the climate science comes in. Um, there's scientific evidence that the greenhouse gases we're emitting are actually causing this, the, this warming. And the, um, the, the way I want to sort of de develop that is really keep it, um, I, I really just want to sort of reference what's, what's out there. And this is in the spirit of don't, don't talk too much about things you, you don't know. Um, there was a, a, a very large um, report that was um, pr produced. It's, we, we just call it the IPCC, the Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change. Um, it's, a, it's, it, it's, it, it's a massive work. I, I'm not aware of any other community that can sort of have this kind of um, 
consensus building kind of sort of a concerted effort to sort of produce a, a synthesis of a current state of knowledge in, in a field. Um, the, um, this, this report involved about 600 scientists. It, it, it was re reviewed by representatives from about 118 nations. And really what I want to do now is, is, is give you some things that, that we know. And what I mean by know is that this is a, a largely a scientific consensus among, among the climate community. And I'm really going to hit these three points of the climate change <laughs> tripod. First of all, global warming. Um, the, uh, the warming of the climate system is unequivocal. And I'm putting back again this, this plot that shows the the global temperatures in, in increasing. Um, the, the other side of this is um, increases in, in greenhouse gases. And uh, the, the key here is that <clears throat> the um, concentrations of carbon dioxide and then the, there are some other, uh, other, other gases that are, that are related to um, industrialization and human activity have increased markedly as a result of human activities since 1750, about when we really sort of started um, in, in industrialization. And there's that, there's that graph again. Okay, so that's, that's the second part. Um, the, the third part is, is sort of the most interesting, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this, because this is the causal effect. Um, but, but remember that these are just quotes that I've act, abstracted from the IPCC report, and actually the, these quotes have been um, fought over word for word in terms of people having a, an, an agreement on them. Um, but, but here it is. Most of the observed increase in global average temperatures since the mid 20th century is very likely due to the observed increase in anthropogenic. Anthropogenic just means human. I, I don't know why they don't say just human, but um, <laughs> anthropogenic greenhouse gas concentrations. Okay, so, 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 so there they are. Um, Here's, here's sort of a, a summary plot of that. And um, everyone brings sort of personal feelings and, and baggage to this whole thing. But, but I'd say that this, this, this simple plot is something that, that convinces me. It, it may not convince you. But what we have here is, is really a very sort of um, schematic. Um, here's, here's our global temperatures. These are observations. So this is point, point one that we we're, we're feel very confident in this black line. Um, these two shaded areas are an attempt to use a, a scientific model, a climate model, to try to reproduce global temperatures. And so you look at this and you say, um, this seems to be doing OK. Um, I'm a little bit concerned about here, but overall it seems to be getting the trend. I don't know about this model. This model seems to be doing pretty poorly. It, it turns out that this is a model where we've subtracted out the greenhouse gases produced by humans. So this is a model that's sort of trying to describe what we would see in temperatures in the last century if there was no extra burden of CO2 produced by human activities. And it's this difference that the, um, the IPCC has related as very likely. Um, so that, that's the kind of how, how, how the weight of the evidence. Okay, so that's, um, that's it. So that's, that's my background on, on, on sort of climate, the, the, the climate um, overall panorama. And what I'd like to do is sort of build off of that. The, um, the first thing I, I wanna do is I, I want to sort of explore a, a little bit about climate models and, and tell you a, a, um, a, a little bit more about them. Um, we've had some really good talks in, in the earlier sessions on, uh, on climate models and sort of very nice sort of analyses. Um, th this is really, as I said, just um, things in pictures. So, um, so what, what is this? A climate model, first of all, it's a computer program. Um, for those of you that, that, that came in early to the talk to, um, to get a good seat, um, um, I also put up an animation of a, of a climate model running. And if, if you notice that, you could sort of get an appreciation of, of the detail of these and sort of the, the complexity of them. Um, that was the N, N, NCAR model, and it was running at a fairly high resolution, but it sort of gives you an idea of sort of um, how, how, how well these things work. 
Um, it's used to simulate current climate, and, and that's sort of what I showed you in, in, in that last view. We were able to simulate both with and without greenhouse gases, and it can also be used to, to make projections about future climate. And I thought Hans, um, Hans Rudi made an excellent um, explanation of why these are called projections, and, and it's because they, the, uh, the, the climate community feels if they call these predictions, then people will th think that they're actually predictions of something in the future. And as I, a as I go into this, it will become clear why, why they're projections. Okay, so what are, what are the climate system model components? Well, first of all, it, it models the entire Earth. You, you can't do this by just modeling part of the Earth. Um, you, you have to get the whole thing in there. Um, it, it, it involves the land, it involves the interaction between the atmosphere and the land. It involves basic atmospheric processes like, like thunderstorm, like um, um, rain and, and other kinds of motion. It also involves the ocean here. I, I just have the surface of the ocean, but these climate models also consider all of the ocean down, down, down to the bottom. And the, uh, the, 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 the temperature of the ocean at, at various depths is important because it actually stores heat over long time scales. There, there's also a component that has ice, and there's also a component of the model that, that um, includes veg vegetation. So these are fairly complicated things. They involve very different kinds of um, processes, and um, they're also very big. Um, they're big in the sense that they have to run on, on fairly large computers and they produce lots of data that has to be stored. Um, they're also big just in terms of their um, size. The, the, the actual programs involve millions of lines of code and involve many, many people working on them. Um, so um, I, I call this big, big iron and, and that's sort of the, uh, the term for, for supercomputers, at least in the US. Um, it turns out that these, um, th this is a single computer all the way down this whole alley and the way these computers are built is that there's sort of many different cabinets and the cabinets are full, are full of just se separate processors. Um, we, we recently got a, a new computer at NCAR and, and it looks the same, it's cabinets full of, full of processors. Um, it turns out that these, th these cabinets, they're, 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 um, very sturdy, and they, they involve a lot of metal, not only in their framework, but in the actual electronic components. And it turns out to, to move these just in the building is, 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 is very, very difficult. Um, fully loaded, these things weigh equivalent to a, a, a NASCAR racing car. So imagine taking a fairly, um, fairly hefty car, putting it up on its side, and then trying to move this through, through, through the building. And so at, at that point, you can see why they call these things big, big iron, because they're, they're just sort of big and, and heavy. Um, people off, often make jokes that these, these things often require quite, quite a bit of power. And, and so there's sort of a self-serving kind of aspect of climate change research where we need bigger computers and we're going to use more electricity and we'll be creating more CO2 and sort of enhancing this effect so we can keep our jobs and keep on studying it. Um, but but any, anyway, so, so those are the computers. So we have um, complicated computer models that run on, on large computers, and that's sort of the basis of trying to find this causal relationship between greenhouse gases and the, um, and, and the warming. Okay, I, I want to talk about uncertainty now, and um, if if you asked me, um, would I ever be quoting Donald Rumsfeld um, a few months ago, I would have said, you've got to be kidding. Um, but um, re regardless of, of what you think of Mr. Rumsfeld, keep, keep in mind he, he did run the Pentagon. And day to day, he did encounter lots of stuff. And um, so here, here's the way he sort of categorized things. Um, there are known knowns. These are things we know that we know. Um, there are known unknowns. That is to say, there are things that we know we don't know. Um, but finally, um, but there are also unknown unknowns. Um, there are things we don't know that we don't know. Okay, so what, what does this have to do with this talk? Um, I've sort of tried to organize some of the, the way we do statistical thinking. And um, what I presented um, just in, in terms of, I said, this sort of, um, 
overall view of, of, of climate change, I would say these are things that we pretty much know. Things like saying global temperature has warmed, CO2 increases are, have, have increased over the last century. Um, there, there's a strong scientific causal relationship between increased CO2 and, and the warming. Those are our known knowns. Now what statistics can do is for, it can tell us about the, the unknowns that we can at least categorize and, and talk about. And um, the way I'm going to finish this talk is talk a, a little bit about the unknown unknowns. But really, we're going to spend most of our time now talking about the known unknowns. So how do statisticians do that? Um, we like to, uh, to quantify uns uncertainty by, by distribution. So for example, this, this is where I live, Boulder, Colorado. The, um, what I've done is simply taken the, the daily pre precipitation for Boulder over about 50 years, and I've just made a histogram of it. Now what I've done is I've um, made a, a histogram that, that only includes rain that's, that's fairly large, greater than um, about a, a quarter of a, a, of a millimeter. Um, but, but there it is. So um, there are many days re represented here. You can see out here there's a, there's a few days where we had actually large, large amounts of rain. Um, the mean of this is 1.6 millimeters, which is right about here. Um, and really, all, all I want to say at this point is if I said the average daily rainfall in Boulder um, is, is 1.6 millimeters um, above this threshold and just gave you that single number, um, that really doesn't tell you very much when you actually look at this distribution and think about the uncertainty. And we're, we're, we're going to come, come back to this when we talk about rainfall extremes. Um, here's another distribution. Um, so uh, I, I like this because um, it's a chance to show you some art. Um, J Jason Sal Salivan actually is, is an artist. You can go on the web and look up his, um, look, look up his, his, his page. And he has these, these series of, of works um, called 100 Special Moments. And so what he's done is he's gone on the internet and um, let me see if I can, uh, you know, actually, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to try to in, enlarge one of these. But what these are is these are all wedding couples. And um, digitally, he's taken these and he's, he's averaged them together. And so here's your average wedding couple. And um, again, let me, let me hit this theme of uncertainty. So um, this is our average wedding couple. And we can say, well, how, how uncertain are we about what what a couple looks like, well, this is a good distribution. And if we actually looked at each of these pictures, oops, we'd see, we'd see different things. And, and really, the, the variability sort of among these different couples is sort of telling us the, the sort of uncertainty in this picture. Um, the, uh, I'm now going to switch and talk about my statistical projects. And um, the key here, remember, is we want to know about we want to know about the unknowns. Um, there, there are known unknowns, and we're going to sort of try to quantify those and, and understand their their shape and their extent. Um, the way I'm going to do that is, is is by distributions like this. And so, um, in fact, I'm, I'm going to be showing you lots of pictures and means of those pictures, and and it's the same it's the same process. Um, we're going to use that to, to sort of show the uncertainty. Um, let's see, there was something else I was going to say. Uh, well, any, anyway, um, go, to, go to Jason Sal. Oh, the, the, the other point I wanted to make is that um, this guy is a little bit, um, he's certainly on, on the artist's side in the sense that uh, his work is this is this average. Actually, he doesn't quite use an average. He uses a weighted, he, he, he averages the average and the median pixels together and, and has some philosophical interpretation that that's both the, the, the mean and, the, and sort of the, the, the median at the same time. But, but he, doesn't, he doesn't really show you this sample that he's derived the mean. And he doesn't really tell you how he got that sample. 
Um, clearly, it's, it's not random because all the, all the brides are on the, on the left side, all the grooms are on, on the right. And I'm sure you, you know from the, the talk this morning by, um, by uh, Professor Spiegelhalter that, that you know, that's probably not, not due to chance. Um, <clears throat> the, the statistical samples that, that, that I'm going to be showing you have this same kind of visual impression, although the, the statistical samples are much more rigorous in how I, I've generated them. And while I'm omitting, um, omitting all the formulas, not showing you any of the computer programs, um, you, could, you could reproduce these if you, if you wanted. Um, okay, so the rest of this talk has three parts. I'm going to talk about climate in the past, climate in the present, and climate in the future. And um, each of these are, are projects where I've had the, um, the, the, the fortunate um, to, to, to work with other people. Um, this, th this first one is, is Bo Lee, who's, um, who's a, a statistical scientist at NCAR on, on her way to Purdue in the fall. Um, and Casper Amon is a, is a paleo climate person at, at NCAR. Okay, so how do we know temperatures before there were thermometers? Um, if we're interested in long-term variation in climate, um, we, we really have, have to know how to do that because there's, as I said, temp thermometers only go back to about 1850 for a very wide global network. There, there's a few very long records that, that go back into the 1700s, but, but, but that's about it. And I, I just sort of put up a little collage here of, of different ways we can do that. So these are proxies for thermometers. The, the width and density of tree rings tell you something about how hot or, or cool the, the growing season was. Um, simil similar ideas when, when we look at pollen, um, they'll, they'll tell us what kinds of plants were growing locally. And these, the, these reflect certain kinds of climates that were present. Um, ice cores trap, trap air, air bubbles, which can then, then be analyzed, and you, you can infer temperature from that. Um, there's also another in, in, in interesting measurement um, where, where you simply um, go down a, 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 long, a long borehole in, in the ground and simply measure the temperature at, at, at different depths. And um, these temperatures are related to temperatures in the past. Basically, the, the deeper you go, um, the, um, what, you're, what you're measuring is an, is an average temperature that's over a longer period in time, but also farther back. It's sort of like, a, as you go down, it's sort of like a time machine where you see um, earlier temperatures. Um, but anyway, we have, a, have all these sources. Um, you can put them together and, and make reconstructions of, of past temperatures. And um, what I've put up here is, is um, well, we call this the, the spaghetti plot when we were um, assembling this. Um, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's, it, it's based on, 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 on these, these different kind of um, what they would call climate proxies. Um, the green is tree rings. Um, let's see here. I think I have. Okay, um, so the, these multi-proxy um, series, su such as this, uh, this sort of dark, dark orange one and involved tree rings and, and other, other kinds of um, measurements. And, but really, w what we see here is, is we see a warming in the, in, in the last century, quite a bit of variability and disagreement among these, um, but ov overall sort of lower, lower temperatures. Um, this is interesting, and it's, and it's a nice representation of what the, the paleo community does. Although this, I would argue that this diagram has a little bit of the same problem as Jason Sullivan's art, in that it's a, it's a sample, and we might even be brave and take the average of this. But you would have to ask, if we're taking the average of this, wh what's it an average of? Tell me where this sample came from. And, and really, it, it's difficult to say what's being sampled here because um, we're not sure if there's common data be between these different curves. Um, we're, we're not sure if there's really other analyses that should be done and included in this. This is really pretty idiosyncratic, idiosyncratic based on, on what, the, um, what the researchers do in this field. So really all, all I'm going to talk about is, is a statistical approach to this. 
Um, it's, it's a way of generating sort of a, a spaghetti plot, if, if you will, where um, each of, the, um, <clears throat> each of these, these temperature curves have been selected according to a, 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 a distribution where it, it's statistically sort of well-defined and coherent. And what, it, what I've done here is these are the temperatures that we've measured, the, the red. So that's, that's related to that global temperature series that I showed you early on. The, these past, these, um, this past climate, you see three colors here, and this is basically three, three brides and grooms, if you will, drawn from a statistical dis distribution. And um, since I'm, I'm, I'm doing this and sort of based on formulas, I can generate a, as many of these as I want. Um, we, we generated a, a thousand of these, um, so more, instead of three, we generated a thousand. Um, here's the mean curve. Um, this gray is the, is the variability of, of, about that mean curve based on all these, all these thousand different possibilities. Um, the interpretation of each of those curves is that each of those curves is in some sense equally consistent with the climate proxy data that, that we're using. Um, their variability re represents our uncertainty. And, and so, so here it is. So, um, so what, what we've done is, is we, we've generated a sample. Um, the interesting uh, scientific aspect of this is that um, in the last IPCC report, there was some um, claims about the, the most recent temperatures that, that we've seen, that is in the, in the 1990s, as being the warmest in the past thousand years. Um, specifically, that they said the decade of the 90s is the is the warmest decade that we've seen in the past thousand years. Um, using this kind of statistical sample, if you, um, if you make the assumption that the, the data and the, and the model that we're using is, is reasonable, you can actually try to answer that question. And in fact, it turns out that that, that seems to be true, that we actually are, are experiencing the, the warmest temperatures from the past um, based on this kind of reconstruction. Um, you know, one, one thing I didn't say in all of this is that um, in, in, this, in this particular project, this is the average temperature for the northern hemisphere. And, and, that's, and that's one aspect of, of trying to reconstruct past temperature. You, you can reconstruct a very local temperature um, based on, on proxies because you may have lake sediments and, and you can actually relate those lake sediments to climate right at that lake historically, um, or you can, you can combine proxies in, in this much more broad, broad way and get a very large average, in this case, for the entire northern hemisphere. It's sort of hard to go in between. But anyway, there, there, there it is. OK. Um, <clears throat> so the, um, the, the, the next project is um, I'm, I'm going to talk about ex extremes in, in, in rainfall. Um, this is the only picture I could find, find of Philippe. He actually does have a body. <laughs> but um, I, I think I, I understand uh, Rick, Rick Durrett's uh, 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 a bit about his jokes. If you're putting together a talk last minute and you're trying to find pictures of all your authors, you sort of take, t take what you can get. OK, um, present climate. We know a lot about present climate. Um, there are some things, though, that we don't know very well. There are unknowns. And, and of course, this talk is about statistics, so I'm going to tell you a, a little bit about the unknowns in present climate. Um, in fact, uh, in, in particular, I want to talk about ex, 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 extreme events. Um, so I, I love this picture because when I look at this picture, no matter how bad my day is, um, <laughs> that, that engineer's day is a lot worse. Um, th this, this is an extreme event. It, it was probably not due to climate change, though. <laughs> um, this, this picture here, this is also an extreme event, although given that little overhead about Jason Salavan, m maybe this is art. I, I recently went to the Tate Gallery in London, and um, this, this could fit in very well, um, doing this in the in the Thames. Um, but uh, th the reason I put this in and, and the reason I put this in is um, 
clearly this is not due to climate change. Is this due to climate change? Well, we don't know. I mean, it's, it's an extreme event. Extreme events happen. Um, we, if we didn't have extreme events, that would actually be un, unusual. Um, it's, it's very hard to attribute a particular extreme event to, to, to global warming. And that's sort of one, one point I, I wanted to make here. Um, but, but really, the, the, the main thing that, that we're doing in this, in this little section is um, we're talking about present climate. So really, we just want to understand um, something of, about extreme events with our current climate. OK, so um, let's see here. There's a, there's a, lot, there's a lot going on. Um, this is North America. Um, I've just plotted L elevation just, just to highlight the fact that the Rocky Mountains go through here. This little red region is a blow up of Colorado. And I'm going to talk about this, this area here called the Front Range. If you're right about here and look west, you would see this picture. So what we have here is, th this is actually NCAR right there. Um, but we have, um, we have some hills behind NCAR. Behind that is some high country and then some high mountains. And, and you see this is um, probably in the spring because they're, they're still covered with snow. Um, but what I really want to talk about is this is the Boulder Valley, and this is, this is where I live. Um, part of the reason I'm doing this is that I think what will really make a difference to people about, about climate change is when they actually think about their, their local area and are actually informed by the changes that will happen, happen locally. I don't think Singapore is too concerned about losing its snowpack in the winter. But I bet there are other, other issues, perhaps sea level rise, um, maybe in increased frequency of typhoons, which would be very important to, to Singapore, which I could care less about if I live in, in Boulder. Um, but anyway, this is, this is my local, um, this, is, this is where I live. And what I want to talk about is, is, is extreme rainfall. Now, extreme rainfall is important because if it falls on these foothills, and the water funnels down into these canyons, it can produce catastrophic floods. Um, th there was a flood about 40 years ago where actually 140 people were, were killed due to this sort of um, sudden in influx of water coming, coming down a canyon. OK, um, technically, the way people describe extreme rainfall events is in sort of these, these things in years, like what is the 25-year rainfall event? What is the 100-year flood? And I think I'm going to lapse into this. And I just wanted to give you this terminology so it wouldn't be too confusing. But really, what, what, the, what a 25-year 25 year rainfall event means is that in, in a particular year, there's a 1 out of 25 <coughs> chance of, 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 of seeing this. Or you tend to see these on the average about every 25 years. Um, so I'm, I'm going to focus on, on this kind of event. Typically, um, the, the floodplains for buildings are drawn with a 100-year with a event in, in mind. OK. So um, here's, the, here's the Boulder precipitation data. Um, this is, I made a histogram of this earlier. I'm, um, I'm thresholding this at, at about point, um, let's see, about 25. Actually, I got my, my units wrong. I, you know, the units originally were in centimeters. So, so we're thresholding this at about 25 millimeters. And um, because we really only want to look at, at the big daily rainfall. Now, Boulder doesn't get a, a lot of rainfall. So in other areas, thresholding at, at 25 millimeters per day would, wouldn't, wouldn't make sense. Um, so there, there, there's the data. And really, what we want to do is, is simply to describe how often do we see these, these really big rainfall events? The other point I wanted to make about this is that um, for Boulder, this is it. This, this is all the data we have. We only have 50 years of, 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 of rain, rainfall data. Um, when you actually think about the kind of questions that, that, that you could ask about climate and look at the available data, you see it's, it's shockingly sparse. Um, it, it, it's, it's sparse for um, well-developed, well-settled areas. Um, when you go to the, to the developing countries, um, if, you, if you look in, in Africa, um, the, the data is, is even less. 
And it's even more so when you consider the ocean, especially things below the surface. And so it's actually um, part of the whole side of, of current climate is that we really don't know as much as we would about current climate because we, we don't have the observations. Okay, the, the other interesting thing about this, uh, the reason I'm highlighting 50 is um, this may seem sort of strange to try to talk about a 100 year event when you only have 50 years of data. Um, the other thing you might ask if you were, um, if, if you were sharp, sharp students is you might say, why are you talking about a 100 year event when climate is defined as a 30 year average? Um, if, if climate change is happening, what does it make sense to talk about a 100 year event or a 500 year event? Because, I mean, the, the bus has already left the station. I mean, there's, there's other things happening and um, it wouldn't make sense. But as I said, really, um, saying something is, is a 100 year event is really talking about a probability of one out of uh, 100th of, of it occurring in a given year. Okay, so um, here's my, um, here's my an analysis of this. I'm not gonna tell you um, how I got this curve or write, write the equation or, um, or exactly how I calculated this, but it turns out that for Boulder, the, the 25 year event is, is about nine, nine centimeters. Um, so let's see, that would be about, uh, what about four inches? Is that? Yeah, about. Three, three inches. Three inches or, nine. Pardon? <laughs> okay, so, so, so there we are. Um, the other interesting thing about this is um, what we would like to do is, um, is extrapolate this to all, all of the, the, the front range. So remember the, 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 the Colorado front range is, 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 this, um, is this strip, strip of um, territory that sort of straddles the mountains and, and is also and includes the plains. It includes most of the population in, in Colorado. And so what, what I'm doing here is, is I'm simply trying to estimate these, these same values that I estimated, oops, these same values that I estimated for Boulder, this nine centimeters, um, if I live um, 10, 10 kilometers from Boulder, I won't say five, you know, five miles, if I live 10 kilometers from Boulder, I might like to know what, what my value is here. Is it still nine centimeters? Is it, is it something else? Um, if you're building roads, um, if you're planning neighborhoods, you, you need to know these sort of extreme precipitation estimates every everywhere, you, you can't just restrict yourself to particular towns. Um, and here's, here's my analysis of that. Um, I'm, I'm not even gonna throw out the statistical terminology here because this is a public lecture. And, and basically you, you either know, know what I've done through the talks or, or, or looking at our papers or it, it, it doesn't really matter. But again, here are our happy, happy brides and grooms. Um, we're generating samples, um, and, and this is a, a spatial map. It's, it's colored by the places where, um, where red is a, a high level of, um, red is a, is, is, is a, is a high level of, of, of precipitation in 20 years, um, and, and we're, we're going down to this um, beige is a, is, is a low level. So I have all these samples, and I can take their average, and this is sort of looking like the average bride and groom. It's, it's a summary. And so what we see here is, um, first of all, the, the black dots are, are the actual observation stations, um, the places where I have precipitation observation to, to generate this map. Um, and um, you, you can see that there's variation from one sample to another, and that's describing our uncertainty. The average is a summary of these, but we could also use how these maps vary from each other to um, quantify the uncertainty. Um, another way to, to view this is to overlay this on, on topography. Um, this, is, um, this is also a, uh, a way to, uh, I, I should say I, I did all this in R. So if you've had any reservations about R not being able to do graphics at least, this is, um, this is something you can do if you're willing to um, um, <clears throat> boot up your laptop on, on a long plane flight and, and entertain yourself. Um, so uh, again, what we have here is that this is the front range. There's sort of um, pl 
plains and sort of dry area here. Um, we see that there's concentrations where there's high, high precipitation. So again, we're talking about an event that might happen once every 25 years. So the, these are e extreme events. We can see that nine centimeters is, is about at the end of this color scale here. Boulder is, is about, that's the Boulder um, lo location. And we can see that we're sort of close, that, that sure enough, it is matching that sort of nine centimeter. Um, but the, what, what's interesting is that the, the extreme precipitation is not occurring on the, on the tops of the mountains. It's sort of occurring right up next to them. And that, and, and, and that makes sense in terms of, of the way these, these storms work, is that they sort of, um, the, the severe storms are initiated sort of close, close to the mountains, but not directly on top of them. Okay, so that's, that's climate present. And remember that what I'm trying to do here is give you an idea of saying, in the present, there are things that we still don't quite know well, and, and we need to understand the unknowns. Clearly, if we want to talk about will climate change cause more flooding, we have to understand the probability of simply getting flooding now under our, our current climate. Um, so, so what I showed you was sort of the, the first step in doing that. OK, um, I want to end by uh, talking about climate in, in the future. And, and this, is, this is where we get into the models. Um, this, is a, this is a project that, that Steve Sane has done, and um, R Ruby Lung is a, is a modeler at Pacific North, Northwest Labs. Um, you can see that PNL, I, I think, somehow must, must require all their employees to have a very nice um, em employee photograph, because um, it looks very, very spiffy. Um, OK, so model, model projections involve two ingredients. They involve a climate model, and they also involve a story. It's a story of what we think the future is, is, is going to be like. One story might be business as usual. We're not going to do anything about fossil fuel emissions. We're going to keep on going just the way we are. And, and then people can say, OK, then I can sort of project what kinds of CO2 increases they'll, they'll be. Um, the, um, as Reinhardt was talking about in his talk, there are other scenarios um, that, that range from sort of uh, very sort of draconian measures where um, greenhouse gases are, are restricted to sort of more moderate ones. Um, so, so that's, that's our story. I'm, um, I'm also going to be using a, a regional climate model in this, um, in, in this example. So, so what happens, and, and this is related to Kerry Kaufman's talk, it, is that we're, we're going to be using two models, and I'm not going to go into much details about this, where we're going to be able to get very fine information over the western US. And the, the reason we want to do that is, is because um, in order for me to sort of get interested in climate change or to understand its impacts, I, I need to know what's going to happen locally. Um, for example, I would like to know what happens in, in, in Denver, the largest, the large city near, near Boulder. Um, I'm not interested in global averages. I'm interested in, in my own situation. Um, so th this is a, a particular regional model. It, it's the one that Ruby maintains at um, Pacific Northwest Lab. The actual scenario that, that she uses is a little bit before the IPCC um, coding. It's simply a 1% increase in CO2 per, per year. And um, Reinhardt, do you know, do you know what, that, what that is in, in terms of, yeah? Uh, A2? OK. Yeah. OK, 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 so um, I, I think you're starting to see the structure of this talk. Um, so we have, we have bride and grooms. Um, this is a double wedding um, because we're interested in, in temperature and precipitation si simultaneously. And, and the reason I'm doing this is that um, in Colorado and in m many other places, I'm, I'm interested not only in the fact that it may be warmer, but also whether or not it's going to be combined with being drier. Um, so if, if, you have, if you have warmer temperatures and also drier temperatures, it's, it, it's compounded. 
Um, the other reason I'm going through this is that this is just an example of saying, um, in terms of thinking about um, future climate changes, it, it's really, um, you have to consider several variables simultaneously. For Singapore, it, it may be a different set of variables, but in, in, um, in, 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 in the West, th this, is, this is a place to start. So uh, again, I'm, I've done a statistical analysis on this, on this regional climate that we've both run in the present and in the future. Um, it's important to keep in mind that I'm looking at, at, at differences here. And um, the tip, typically, the, the culture in climate modeling is that differences are good. Um, the, the model output by itself for a given situation is, is not as good. And so that, that's why they, they want to look, look at differences here. Um, so, so these are maps that are describing the, the possible differences in temperature suggested by the model. There's the average. So you can see um, red is, is hot, um, yellow is, is cool in this. Um, in, thi in this case, um, blue is dry and edging up into red and yellow is, is wet. So, so we see some drying in, in the Pacific Northwest and in California, and we see warming in the, in the Northwest and California. Okay, but how, how do we make sen sense of all this? Well, I'm going to um, end by showing you a, a very simple way of, 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 of doing this. And, and really, this is what statistics is, is about, is simply sort of generating distributions and trying to um, s summarize them and, and, and interpret them. Uh, what I've done is um, for all of these maps, I've simply pulled out specific cities. I've pulled out their, their temperatures and I've pulled out their precipitations. And um, here's, here's what Denver looks like. Um, so in terms of this particular regional model experiment, I, have, I see this kind of distribution of temperature changes. I see this kind of distribution of precipitation changes. And here's how they're varying jointly. Um, I put this green arrow on here just to remind me that there's actually one event that's, that's way out here. Um, it's some kind of extreme event in the model. And um, that, that could be important. I mean, that, or, or it could be very strange. It, it could also tell you that maybe this model isn't, isn't doing something right. Um, but, but anyway, here's, here's my... Here's my sample of, um, we could call these, the, these are all the, all the weddings for, for Denver. There's the average wedding sitting right there. This, this contour is a 50% contour that um, would include about 50% of these points. Um, it's important to realize that um, this 50%, this whole analysis is assuming that this climate model makes sense. And um, that's something that I'm not going to talk too much ab about in this talk, but that's, that's one of those unknowns that's left for, for future work. Um, we can do this for quite a few cities. <clears throat> and so here, here's Denver, and we have other cities where I've done the same kind of scatter plot and found, found the 50% contour, and, and here they are. So. Um, what, what we've done here is we've taken a, a geophysical model. We've added a fairly complex statistical method, which I have told you nothing about, but is, is something that would appear in a, in a journal, and it's, um, and it's scrutinized by other people, um, and it's, and it's re reproducible. But what we've tried to derive here is these x's mark how a possible, under a possible um, scenario for, for um, human behavior, how climate might change, and then these, these circles indicate our uncertainty in that. So go, going back to, um, to Donald Rumsfeld's quote, um, we have known knowns, we have known unknowns, and I would claim that in, in this case, we've, we've sort of um, been able to quantify what those known unknowns are. Okay, so uh, I want to wrap up. Um, before I forget, I want to thank you all again for coming at this, at this last talk in, in a long day. Um, so what do I have to say? Well, I have two quick points, and then my last point is, is very important. So first of all, the broad magnitudes of climate change and its cause at a global scale are largely known. 
Um, there's a, a tremendous scientific consensus about this, and it was reached by a very sort of open and, um, and rigorous kind of procedure. The, the details of that can, can be debated, um, but, but basically th these are things we know. Um, I've given you three examples about um, past climate, present climate, and future climate where we can quantify the known unknowns. Um, there are unknown unknowns that are beyond statistics, um, but they still pose risks that, that we share. And um, I, when, w one of my colleagues at, at NCAR is, is very skeptical about climate models because he actually works with weather models and he knows how crazy these things are. And he says, you know, look, greenhouse gas is causing warming. I can do that on the back of an envelope. It's, it's a very simple en energy balance. He said, what really scares me is the unknown unknowns, that we're doing an experiment to our, the place where we live. It's uncontrolled, and certain things can happen that, that we don't know. Some of them can be beneficial. Some of them could be very bad. Um, a typical example people use is, the, um, is sh shutting down some of the ocean currents in the Atlantic, which would um, gravely affect the, the European climate. But there are many other things that, that could happen that, that we don't, don't know about. So um, this is another argument for climate change that I would say is an intellectual one where um, really if we're going into unknown unknowns, we, we should really sort of minimize um, our risk with those. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot, Doc, for this nice lectures. I think we would like to have at least a few questions. I don't think we'll be able to solve everything, but please, who would like to start? Yeah, Peter. Hi. Um, I, would, I was very interested, of course, in your, your graphs of the predictions, for example, the ones you gave towards the end where you indicated uh, uh, how temperature might rise and rainfall might, might drop simultaneously. Um, but what, what interests me as a statistician is, is whether we can decouple the, uh, the effects that, that climate change will have on, our, uh, on, the, on the climate, of course, of the, of the places where we live, from the effects that are due to random fluctuations. Uh, I've, so, for example, if, if, I look at, if I look at Australia, there are several Australian cities who have built or are, are building desalination plants. And I have a, a colleague who's an applied mathematician who works for, or, or who assists uh, some of the governments who are, who, who are developing these plants to, to separate the effects that they see in recent uh, rainfall and, and climate figures uh, to separate the, the effects of, of fluctuations that would be there anyway from the effects of climate change. And so, for example, he's, he's quite negative about the construction of a desalination plant for Sydney because he believes he can show fairly convincingly that the, uh, the, 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 the drop in rainfall that Sydney had over a long period was due to a fluctuation, not due to climate change, but he's quite supportive of the construction of a desalination plant for the city of Perth over in the southwest because the opposite is true there. Right. How does he do that? Is this a very simple thing to do, or I mean, it's, it, I, I haven't been able to get a no. satisfactory explanation from no, him. No, I would, I, 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 I would say, Peter, um, trying to figure out how precipitation may change at, at a subcontinent scale yeah. is is still not not quite within the realm of what climate the climate community can can do. It's. Okay. Um, it, it's just, uh, I mean, you, you might say Australia seems, um, seems um, you, 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 you should be able to say something of, about that. It's even half of Australia is, is a big place, but yes. it's still small relative to the global kinds of models that they run. And you, you can't get a picture of what's happening in a small region without really getting a good picture in the global model. Is that what you're getting at? Right, yeah. right. Okay, right. so. Right. 
there, there, you know, th there are certain, certain um, tools they can use, um, but I think the, 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 the brief answer is that it, it's still very difficult. And okay, so we can't do it reliably yet. Right. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, someone else. Yeah. Yeah. So in that sense, they may stick to a much more unbiased opinion in terms of how to doubt this level. But one particular example, we show three different types of known and known and known and unknown and known. But there is one specific thing that they have to mention something that you think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that particular yeah. part is also, you know, in, in yeah. Yeah. introduced by this yeah. particular selections of scientists in, in, yeah. in the part of the yeah. involvement. Yeah. So, so, so just, just, just very briefly, the, the, um, the, the way to think about the scientists that contributed to the IPCC, it would be like we just took everybody in this room for a statistics report. Yeah. I mean, there, there's, there's nothing really very. Um, uh, calculating of, uh, about this. The, the, other, the other part of the report is that besides <laughs> the, the scientists that, that write it, there, there is an open, open set of comment. There's an open period to, to, to comment on the report. And this is an opportunity for anyone to send in comments and, and try to contradict what's happening. Every comment that's received for the IPCC must be addressed in some way. Of course, it, it could just say we, we're, we're not going to put this in the report, but um, there, there's a very rigorous procedure for dealing with any kind of comment. So this th this th this thing is um, it's it, it's really a very representative um, view of science. I mean, maybe some people have been excluded, but not to the point of coming up with biased conclusions. I mean, that, that also subject to, of course, you know, I can see how, how rigorous that the older study is being done. Yeah. But it, there's another thing that's also involved, the simulator that you built, constructed to trying to uh, mimic the, the environmental changes. Yes, yes. That process is a very complicated uh, process because in, in, in the company that we, I work with, we built very, uh, a lot of those simulators involve a different level of complexity. Right. So we actually know how those things actually can do. But for, for the, the type of simulator we built, they are more, more or less, in, it's in some sense that you can control. Okay. So regardless of how much unknown that you, you actually don't know, that the, the thing that you control can become something that, that actually that w can, can be, <coughs> will, will follow the process. But in nature, in some sense, those are chaotic in the sense that you don't really know the unknown. So without those, you know, uh, th those things that you can control, but you're actually trying to build something that yeah. is not, uh, not something that you can, you can predict or you can actually see it, that, that's going to subject to a lot of uh, risk, in particularly the data that you have. Right, right. Such a limited right. amount of time. Right. And trying to interpolate yeah. into, well, into well, let's, those things. Yeah. Well, let's, let, let, let's, let's be very clear about, in terms of looking at, at present, at, at the past century, where we have observations and we can run models, um, we, we can see that causal relationship between greenhouse gas emissions and in increased warming. Um, the, other, the other part of using the models is, is to do the future projections. And, and of, of, of course, these, these projections are only as believable as we think these models include all the major components of, 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 of what we need. And your, your, your comments are, are perfectly appropriate. And, 
Yeah. Yeah, but I had a, I had a really quick, um, I guess, question and comment. So, so a lot of the stuff you're talking about is very interesting, and I sort of think of this as sort of a status quo propagating projections. By that I mean like sort of Beck's mellow goal, like I'm a loser baby, sort of get all the headlights and put it in neutral. But if we had like John Lennon statistics and projections, let's say we make a Markov control process out of maybe having like ocean thermal energy converting buoys that are sucking the nutrient rich cold water from the oceans to increase the primary carrying capacity of algal blooms so that we can actually just use renewable energy floating platforms of ocean thermal energy converting objects as a Markov control process to see whether we can actually, you know, bring the perturbations down. Can you use your iron machines to actually start doing sort of this type of, you know? Um, no. <laughs> um, so, so I think I think that what you were talking about is the is the possibility where we could actually in, intercede and say say put aerosols in the air. I, I think you were refer, re referring to putting um, seeding the ocean with iron to encourage no, 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 algal I'm blooms. About seeding the ocean with phytoplankton so that the electron transport chain in the mitochondria can be used to with the solar radiation to take the photon and absorb the carbon dioxide back. So the nucleus yeah. Of carbon. Yeah. So Yeah, I don't, I, I, I don't know. Um, I, I don't think that's been beta tested. <laughs> <laughs> One remark, maybe Rumsfeld should have thought a little bit more about what he thought he knew but didn't know. <laughs> well, or, or I, I would call it he, he has uh, unknown unknowns that, that he really didn't. Um, try to minimize his risk. Yeah, right. yeah, Michael? I'm not sure. The, the, the best I can answer there is to turn it around to say that we've already committed to a certain amount of warming in the future be, because there's going to be a longer term response of the ocean. Um, if we, um, I'm, 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 I'm not really sure what, what would happen. And of course it would also be, um, it would also be moderated by saying, okay, so how much, how much CO2 will we decrease? Uh, how much will our, our emissions de decrease? So, um, yeah. the, you know, go going into the IPCC reports, they would have very clear kinds of projections of how the different um, scenarios um, r r relate to different, different kinds of trajectories of warming. Yes, y yes, well, I, I mean, we, we will have to make changes that are, that the next generation will have to live with. Yes, yes, that's, that's an appropriate time scale. Okay, I think it's also time to think about buses or getting home, so I'd like to thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Thank you.